Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna to try to fix this Commodore PET 4016. It's in pretty rough shape as this was a rescue from the e-waste stream, but I think I can get it going. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Ah, the PET 4016. This PET, just like the other PET that you may have seen on my channel, it was actually from the Portland School District. They engraved their information and stock keeping information along the top of the keyboard here. It's funny that in the Portland area here, a lot of people actually have pets that have this engraving in it. It seems that when the school district was done with their pets, they didn't just throw them away. They seem to have gotten auctioned off. And over the years, they weren't just tossed out. They were actually kept and fixed up. But like I mentioned in the intro, this one, for whatever reason, ended up in the e-waste stream while it was about to be e-wasted before it was saved by someone I know and given to me. Besides an obvious high level of filth on this machine, it's actually in pretty good shape. All the keys are there, which is nice because a lot of times they seem to go missing for one reason or another. And I had already removed the two screws that hold this together and inside, everything looks to be complete. Nothing looks like it's been molested in here and no animals look like they were living in here. Just the usual spiders and bugs. It's unfortunate that sometimes where pets are stored, there's a high level of moisture and it actually results in a lot of corrosion on the bottom part of the case. These later 4016s have plastic on the top part and this upper part of the case, but this black part here is steel, so high levels of moisture can cause this to rust out. This particular machine doesn't have any such problems. Looking down here at the chassis, everything's in pretty good shape. It's a 4016-12, which means it has 16K internal. And everything else on the back here, it's all pretty run of the mill. The only real cosmetic blemish I'm seeing on here is this, which while at first glance might look like a pencil mark, it's actually a deep gouge or even potentially a crack in the case. When this machine first arrived in the basement, I did power it up and it did go to basic, but it had some weird issues. Let's see if uh, it's working at all right now. I hear the hum, but I don't hear even the beep. And if we don't get any picture on here, that would imply that the system is not even initializing. Now this is a CRTC based pet, meaning it has a CRTC controller chip that needs to be initialized by the ROM or the kernel at startup. If it doesn't get initialized, you're not gonna get any picture whatsoever. And that actually appears to be what we're getting right now. Ah, okay, I see the problem here. Uh, this was my doing. I think I took this chip out to just give it a quick test in the Retro Chip Tester Pro, and it did test good. Uh, so obviously I didn't reinsert that back into the motherboard and that's part of the kernel. So of course, without that, the system is not even gonna initialize. Let's turn this back on. There we go, there's the familiar startup sound. We should now have an image. There it is. Now, earlier versions of the PET that don't use the universal board, which is the motherboard design that's in this PET and several other later models, they don't use a CRTC controller, a CRT controller IC. They generate the video signal using TTL logic and it reads right out of the RAM. So if you turn those things on, even when the ROMs are not installed, you will get an image and it will be garbage most likely because the ROM or the kernel is necessary to clear out the RAM to give you the familiar startup screen you're used to seeing. But like a monochrome or CGA card on a PC, the ROM is required to actually initialize that CRT controller chip, and without it, you see nothing. And in fact, these monitors won't even power up without the correct sync signals coming from the motherboard, since these do not have internal oscillators. They require that horizontal and vertical sync signals, which is generated by that CRT controller chip running. Now, while you see, we have a booted up machine with a flashing cursor, which means there's a good amount of stuff working on this computer. Clearly something is wrong because the amount of uh, basic bytes free is not right at all. In addition, the startup screen should look something like this, where it at least has a banner at the top that says Commodore Basic, and then it should show the bytes free. And that's missing entirely on this machine. So the first thing I am suspecting is problematic is a problem with the ROM chips here. I won't be able to test any of those until I take them out of the motherboard, which of course involves me taking this machine apart and removing the motherboard from the case. So first things first, let's remove the top cover so this thing is just easier to move around and deal with. 
To do that, I am just going to start by disconnecting all the cables. Ooh, they're very stuck on there. Uh, they go to the top cover. So this is the keyboard cable, and this one is the video cable that goes to the monitor. There is also in the back here, this brown wire, which is a power cable that goes to the monitor. There are two ways you can deal with this. You can remove the cover of the monitor and unplug it from the board and then feed it back through here, or you can desolder the connections right from the transformer. There is also a ground lead right here that is not always there on all PET models, like it isn't there on the earlier ones. So that's gonna need to be disconnected as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop off the top cover and we'll get those off the CRT board. So on these later pets to remove the top cover, there are two screws that are right at the base of the screen here. And you just remove these and then we can kind of hinge that top cover right off. And with the screws out, you can just lift this cover right off. So on this particular monitor design, the power, the ground, and the video signal all come through this connector cable right here. So you just pull this off and then we can feed this back down and pull it out on the other side. But while I'm here, I'm gonna remove these screws here, which allow me to remove the top cover entirely. Although, um, oh, I think there are nuts on the other side, so I'm gonna have to go grab those. They're gonna fall inside, I think. Yep, I just heard that nut fall down. All right, I should be free to lift the entire top cover off the machine. Oh. Oh, I actually made a mistake here. This is the ground lead that goes down to the motherboard or to the underside of the case. So we do have to unscrew this. And now I should be able to lift the entire top cover off. And there we go. And inside the case are those nuts that fell down that were holding the straps on here. So just make sure you Grab the washers and the nuts off those and anything that fell on the motherboard, like so. In case you were wondering what's going on here with this large capacitor and this transformer, this machine uses what's known as a linear power supply. So the mains voltage comes into this AC transformer and is reduced to a much lower voltage. It goes into the motherboard as AC, but much lower than mains voltage, like something like 15 volts or something. It goes through bridge rectifiers and then it goes back out into this large capacitor. And I think this one as well, that smooths that newly formed DC that was based on the AC from the transformer. And then that feeds into these linear voltage regulators right here. And there's a large heat sink here because of course linear supplies generate lots of heat. So because of the particular design of the power supply on the PET, you really can't test the voltages without this all being connected to the motherboard. There's no particularly easy way to disconnect this part of the power supply from all the digital logic circuits. Now, speaking of voltage rails, most of the chips on this board use five volts as is expected, but the RAM on here is 4116 RAM, which requires five volts, 12 volts, and minus five volts. So you have regulators for five volts, but there's also a 12 volts and a minus five volt one. In addition, there's a little bit of a voltage regulator up here, which I probably, I never looked at it, but probably uses a Zener diode, and that is for generating the motor voltage that goes out to the data set drive. Now it's exactly the same specs as the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 data set, so they're all completely interchangeable. And unlike on the early PET models, which have a cassette port over here, and then one on the back, both of them are back here, and this one's actually hidden behind a blanking plate, which you can pop off, so you can hook up two external data sets. Some other small differences to the earlier PET boards is there's a little piezo speaker right here for generating that beep sound that you heard when you turn it on, also any other sounds. Games started using some user port signals for audio on the early pets. And I'm pretty sure what Commodore did is hook up this little speaker transducer to the same signals that uh, those older games used on those early pets. Now throughout my career fixing computers, I haven't worked on a lot of universal pets, which is this particular motherboard design. But all of the ones that I have seen have three socketed chips on them. The CPU, one of the ROM chips, and the character generator ROM, which is this one right down here. These two are always unpopulated. Well, they came like that from the factory, and these were option ROMs that allowed you to expand your machine. In my experience fixing these, the most common problems that you seem to run into are bad RAM, which are these chips along the side here, a bad ROM chip, or ROMs, plural. The CPU is usually good, but where failures often happen are the 6522s, which are the I.O. chips, which control the keyboard and interrupts and things like that. And when those go bad, they can result in a totally non-working machine or one that has no keyboard and no flashing cursor, problems like that. 
And then the last thing that typically is a problem is the video RAM, which are these two chips here, two 114 SRAM chips. It's the same chip that's used in the Commodore 64 for the color RAM. On 40 column machines like this, there are only two chips, but on 80 columns machine, there will be four populated here, and there's some additional logic here to support that. Okay, so the pet is here on the bench, but you may notice one thing that's missing is the monitor. And one of the things is when you're trying to troubleshoot a pet, it's a kind of a pain because you have to have everything plugged into this transformer and whatnot to power the board. And with the monitor sitting off to the side, it's just more space that you need on your bench. But the other thing is, I feel kind of bad turning off and on the monitor over and over and over again because there's no reset switch on this machine. So you may be power cycling it a whole lot. And just to be nice to the monitor, I'd rather not be powering it off and on constantly. Now the earlier pets, like the original one that I've worked on with the uh, spot video, that pet outputs an NTSC-like signal. It still has separate horizontal vertical sync, so you can't just plug it into a composite monitor, but it's pretty trivial to make a little circuit to turn that into a composite monitor, and then you can just plug it into any old monitor, like an LCD or CRT or whatever for testing. But all the pets that use the CRTC actually output a higher scan rate, I think around 20 kilohertz or so, so you cannot just connect it to a normal monitor. So to make my troubleshooting easier on the bench here, I've gone ahead and connected a little header to the monitor connection here, and it's going into this video cable, which then makes its way over to this, the RGB to HDMI. And I've gone ahead and created a profile for the Commodore PET 4016 or any of the ones with a CRTC. And if I turn on the machine, take a look at this. We have a pixel perfect capture of the Commodore PET. The Mate connection is pretty simple. I just checked the schematics and I found the pinout of the connector on the motherboard. Pin five is horizontal sync, pin three is vertical sync, and pin one is the video signal itself. And we have ground, ground, and ground on those three pins. And then on the RGB HDMI, I have a DB9 for CGA or EGA. And I just looked up the pinout on that so I could figure out how to connect this to this. Basically the video signal connects to the green wire and then the horizontal vertical sync is self-explanatory and then the ground. That's all you really need. And on the RGB to HDMI, I created a preliminary profile here, which I will share with Ian, the maintainer of the project, so he can hopefully include this in the releases. But you can see here, at least in the default text mode, when the machine boots up, it all looks really good. I'm also gonna upload my profile to my GitHub page. I'll put a link in the description. So just in case you're looking for that and you can't find it on the release for the RGB to HDMI, you can grab it off my, my repo. All right, so obviously you can see the pet's doing the exact same thing it was before, 3096.01066 bytes free, and there is no banner at the top, but we do have a flashing cursor. Now I've actually had this pet running for about an hour and there's been no other weird issues. It's just exactly the same. It always starts up without any issues. And I felt around to see if any of the ICs are hot and really they're not. I don't really feel anything that's out of the ordinary this is an old machine, so of course the chips aren't going to be super cool running, but nothing is burning hot that would indicate like that is a particular problem. Now I didn't show this when the machine was fully assembled, but when you do turn it on, almost all of the keys on the keyboard didn't work. When you pushed on them, nothing would happen. But that's completely normal for machines of this age, especially pets. I pretty much found that the keyboards never work, especially if the machines are filthy dirty like this one is and not taken care of. You have to disassemble the keyboard and clean all those little rubber pads and the PCB, and maybe some of the keys will start working, but even then, it's very typical that even that's not enough, and you have to uh, apply that little conductive paint onto the rubber pads that will hopefully make good contact. Check out my repair video on my original PET 2001 where I had to paint that stuff on. I will link in the description to that process. But what you can do in the meantime is we can use this Commodore 64 keyboard to at least test that it's registering key presses. Now the keyboard matrix on the 64 in a VIC-20, which is the same, is not compatible with the PET. So if I push the E key, I'm getting the C key on the computer, and that's just because the matrix is not the same. But that's gonna still allow us to push all the keys on this keyboard, and this keyboard does work, and I can just verify that the 6522 that handles the keyboard is at least actually working. And I've gone ahead off camera and I've done that. And indeed, pushing all the keys results in all of the keys being registered. Now the Commodore PET keyboard actually has more keys than the 64 and the VIC-20. So this is not a great test. You're not testing every single thing, 
but I'm generally getting a feel for the fact that those 6522s worked. If most of the keys were dead on this keyboard, then I would know that there's actually a problem on the motherboard with the 6522s. But luckily, everything seems to work properly. Now, one thing is interesting is you can hear that the machine is kind of working. Like when I get to the end of the line, it beeps. That's normal behavior for the pet. But the weird thing is if I keep typing, what happens is when we get to the end of this line, no, no, this line, instead of going down one line below, it wraps around to the top. So clearly something's going on there. That's not supposed to happen. It should just keep wrapping around down towards the bottom of the screen. And if I just keep typing here, it will just keep wrapping around over and over again in this top section of the screen. And eventually it freezes. Now it's totally frozen right now. I think what would normally happen is that there's like a buffer length maximum on the editor, on the pet and on the VIC-20, the 64. And I think when you reach that, that limit, it should just say syntax error or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it does, but it shouldn't just freeze like it's doing here. Now, if I power cycle the machine, you'll notice that there is a full screen of garbage and then it clears it all to black. So we know that the CPU is able to clear the video RAM and that's the ROM doing that at boot up. So that is working. So the fact that the editor can't go to the lower lines is not a problem with the video RAM because the video RAM I don't think would clear properly if it was all stuck at the top. It would maybe clear the first few lines like where we can type into and then the rest would be garbage. Also, for whatever reason, the at symbol on this keyboard causes the computer to immediately freeze. Now that could be the run stop key that maybe is trying to load off the cassette and that part of the computer is broken as well or whatever's wrong here. So there's some strange behavior that's happening. Okay, so before I do any actual troubleshooting, let me talk about what I think is wrong with this board. I think there's a problem with the ROM chips. It's historically something that seems to happen with these older Moss ROM chips, especially these ones from 1980 and 81. This ROM here is the kernel ROM, so this resides in F000 and all the way up to the top of memory. And of course, when you turn on the computer, the 6502 actually has a vector that it starts from, it actually goes to the kernel ROM, and that starts executing the code. But that quickly branches off to this ROM, which lives in the E000 space, but it's actually only um, a 2316, so this is only 2K, and these are 4K each, all the rest of these ROMs. So this only lives in the lower half of E000. It is the editor ROM that actually configures the CRTC, the CRT controller, basically it's booting up the screen. So without this, that's why I got a black screen earlier, and if we were gonna convert this machine to have a screen that ran at 50 hertz, or for instance, if we wanted to use a different keyboard, or any of those types of configurable parameters on these, I think it's the editor ROM that you would be changing out. And then the rest of these ROMs, and these are all 4K each, this lives in the D space, D000, this lives in C, and that lives in B. And then these two expansion ROMs here, I think these live in the A000 and the 9000 space. And I went over to Zimmer's and actually looked at the schematics, and yeah, indeed, these are those two extra ROM chips that are unpopulated. Now, one thing that's interesting about the ROM chips that are on this board and in the two that you put in here are the same is that there are actually multiple chip select lines. So on the schematics here, CS1 is actually what selects the chips. So you can see select F for the F bank, E, D, C, B, A, and nine. But up here on the top of each of these chips, there's another chip select line that's tied together. And this is called no ROM and it's pulled high to five volts. And the interesting thing about that particular signal is it's available on the CPU socket, but it's also available on one of these expansion headers that are over here. But if you pull that particular line low, what happens is it turns off all of the ROM chips, including the two expansion ROMs. Well, I think I've shown on the channel, there's a diagnostic clip that Commodore made that clipped onto the CPU. And inside the box that was attached to the clip was a ROM chip. So when you connected it, it would ground the no ROM line disable the ROMs, and then the CPU would actually boot off the ROM in the diagnostic cartridge, and it would start running diagnostics. And what it would do is it would check your RAM to make sure it was working properly, and if it was, it would then copy the diagnostic routine into RAM and tell you to remove the clip, and that would re-enable the ROMs, and that would allow that diagnostic program, which was now running in memory, to then check your ROMs to tell you if any of those were faulty. Now, it would be a good first step to make sure that the problem on this pet is not just a RAM problem. 
because certainly if some of the RAM bits in the zero page were screwed up, that could affect the execution of the ROM code, causing these weird issues in BASIC. Now, the problem is that diagnostic ROM, like I mentioned, when you clip on the CPU, it runs in place of the kernel ROM, which is this one right here, and that's soldered onto the board. So I can't just easily replace that with a diagnostic ROM. And unless you have that clip, it's kind of impossible. So let me use what I've talked about so far to get the diagnostic clip ROM working on this pet without desoldering anything from the motherboard. What I've gone ahead and done is I took this 2532 EEPROM and I burned it with the clip diagnostic ROM that Commodore provided for this particular motherboard. As I mentioned, there are different revisions of PETs and you have to use the diagnostic clip ROM for your specific unit. Now the 2532 is a drop-in compatible EEPROM for these ROM chips, except for one critical thing. The no ROM functionality that these all support is not supported on this chip. So if I put this in place of one of these basic ROMs, for instance, and someone tried to use the no ROM functionality either by clipping on a diagnostic harness or whatever, it wouldn't work. It would not disable this chip. But I can actually use that to my advantage. I'm gonna install this diagnostic ROM into one of the expansion ROM sockets here. And then if I ground the no ROM signal, all of these chips will be disabled so that this chip can take the place of the kernel ROM and boot the diagnostic. Now, one problem is if I put this directly into this socket, it's gonna be mapped into, I think, the A address space as opposed to the F address space I need it mapped into. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bend out the chip select signal or the pin on this EEPROM. And then when I put it into this socket, it's not gonna get selected by the normal select signal that's on this socket. Next, I'm gonna use these clips here, and I'm gonna clip it onto the chip select line on the kernel EEPROM, so that when this chip is selected by the logic on this motherboard, it's actually gonna select both of the chips at the same time. Normally, we'd never wanna do that, but remember, I'm gonna ground the no ROM signal on the CPU socket here, which is gonna have the effect of disabling all of these ROMs. That's the same as these ROMs literally being removed from the motherboard. A quick check of the PET schematics show us that the no ROM signal right here is found on pin five on the CPU. And we can see right here that pin one is VSS, so that's a ground signal. So I'll just use some of these clips. One, two, three, four, five. And we're gonna ground that no ROM signal right on the CPU socket there. All right, let's turn this on and see what happens. Oh, nothing. I just did a quick check of all the connections and I found one of the pins on the EEPROM was actually out of the socket. Also, these little clip things, they're useful. They're little grabbers, so to speak. You put them on a leg of a chip, plug a wire into there, but they're really, really cheap and junky. And even these ones, like, well, these ones are okay right now, but I had to switch out one because it just wasn't making a good connection and it kept falling off. So just be careful if you buy those. Okay, so let's try turning this on again. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Diagnostics are running. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on here. So it's 40 column ROM, so we know that's right. It's initializing the CRTC controller, so we see a display. Next thing it does is test the TV RAM, and that's this RAM right here. It's the video RAM, this uh, 2K of RAM. I think it's 2K, maybe it's 1K of RAM. Either way, it says it's okay. Next thing it tests is zero page. And on the 6502, zero page is the first 256 bytes of RAM, this RAM, the dynamic RAM on here. The next thing it runs is the stack test. When the stack on this machine starts at 100, and that's hexadecimal. So the end of the zero page is FF, address FF, and then we have 100. So something's going on with the stack test and it says A8 address bat. So that would be the eighth address line on the 6502. Now what address lines are, and I'm just talking like super basic here, is the CPU needs to be able to talk to the various components in its address space. And the 6502 can address 65,535 bytes of RAM or location in its address space. Now it can be RAM, it can be ROM, it can be IO chips, it can be all sorts of things. But for it to talk to address 100, it needs the address line eight to work properly. And if address line eight is say stuck at zero, What's gonna happen when it tries to write to the stack or address 100, it's actually gonna to write to potentially address like zero, like the beginning of the zero page. So I don't think the RAM test that's on this ROM is very good. It's not very comprehensive, but it seems to be saying that it's not able to read and write to the stack properly in the memory. 
Now, unfortunately, this diagnostic does more than just test the stack, uh, but it's stopping right here at the stack test. So it doesn't even go on to do further DRAM testing or any of the testing it does. It just gives up right at this point. Now, before I talk about methods of trying to figure out what's going on with the address line eight or why the stack's not working, there's actually another problem that I can see with the diagnostic that's running here. On the top here, you see all these symbols and letters and numbers. What it's doing is it's printing out all 255 or 256 characters that are possible to be generated through the character ROM, which is right down here. I think it's off the bottom of the camera. Let me move the pet up slightly. There it is, it's this ROM right here. So that's really a test just to make sure that this thing actually is able to generate all the characters. But it's also a little bit of a test for the video RAM because say there was some problems with that, you might not be seeing the correct letters and numbers. Well, the problem is right here is the first two lines of it are cut off. Now I happen to have a picture of this ROM running on another one of my pets and when it tests the stack okay, it also tests the RAM, it doesn't really say anything about it, but then it asks you to remove the clip and that's a flashing box down here. But take a look at the letters and numbers up here. You see all the letters, you see all the numbers, and then it's starting here with a little line and then a circle. And back on this Dynamics ROM here, we're seeing a line in a circle. And that actually totally coincides with what we're seeing in BASIC, where the first two lines are just simply missing. I really think this machine is suffering from more than one problem. I think one of the issues has to do with the video RAM or the logic around it that's causing those first two lines to be cut off versus the DRAM problem or the addressing problem over here that might have logic chips or some other problem that's causing it to not be able to address more than the first 100 bytes of memory. And I'm pretty sure that whatever's going on with the RAM or this addressing problem over here is what's causing BASIC to crash and not work properly, and probably that weird banner message that shows up as well. And that if I solve that issue, the display problem probably is manifested even when the computer is working fine otherwise, and I'll have to go figure that out. So that's two pretty interesting problems on this pet that I'm pretty sure are unrelated. So I think I'm gonna end this video here because it's gotten kind of long, but in the next video, I'm gonna dig in to start seeing if I can fix that addressing RAM problem because I think that's the biggest issue that this machine has. And to do that, I think I'm gonna use this, which is one of those CPU ROM RAM replacements for 6502 based machines that will allow me to swap out all the RAM and the decoding logic around it so we can see that the machine works properly with the RAM swapped out without actually having to desolder anything from the machine. I have a very interesting video on this device where it's using Raspberry Pi. I think I have a Pi 3 here where I can actually edit memory of a running 6502 machine. So I do it with a VIC-20 to demonstrate the cool capabilities of this thing. But of course, a VIC-20 and a Commodore PET, they run exactly the same CPU. So this thing is fully compatible with working on both. I'll put a link in the description to that VIC-20 video. It's definitely worth watching if you haven't seen it. So I think that's gonna be it for this video. If you liked it, thumbs up. All the regular YouTube-y stuff, you know, comments, et cetera, et cetera. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And if you wanna become a patron, you can do so. There's a link in the description below. And don't forget to check out my second channel. Plenty of interesting videos over there in a different format. So if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend you check it out and uh, subscribe over there would be very helpful to me as well. So that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.